The Kingdom of Jerusalem. The frontier of the Christian world. A clash of faiths, a clash of arms. The place was taken and the people were dead. A race against time, a struggle for survival. The Holy Land, a holy war. So they go down fighting and there is slaughter. An amazing story of conflict and of archaeology. <laughs> yeah, it was very hard to stay calm. The Knights Templar, dust and bones. The Crusaders of Vad and Jacob. The medieval world, the fifth to the 15th century. Tim Sutherland is one of Britain's most experienced archeologists. He and a team of specialists try to understand medieval life by exploring the realm of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You couldn't help almost look through their eyes thinking, what did they see? How did they die? Vadim Jacob, or Jacob's Ford, lies on the Jordan River in northern Israel. The ruins today bind their secrets in silence. But in medieval times, this was the frontier not only between kingdoms, but also ideologies, religions. It was the scene of a terrible clash in the long and bloody story of the wars between the Islamic and Christian worlds that dominated the Middle East throughout the medieval period. The Crusades. The Crusades had their origin at the end of the 11th century. The westward migration of Muslim Seljuks led to Pope Urban II's call to recover the Christian East. Anyone who took up the cross would have their sins erased. A holy war. The army of the First Crusade was 100,000 strong, mostly French and Norman knights, soldiers and peasants. They pillaged across Eastern Europe and into Palestine, finally besieging Jerusalem. In July 1099, the Holy City fell. The Crusaders massacred defenders and inhabitants alike, Muslim and Jewish, men, women and children. The Temple Mount was said to be drenched in blood. The Kingdom of Jerusalem was born. It is amazing. It's, there's no other time like it in the medieval period. It's, and it's also quite tragic. It's a war about religion. In 1179, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was around the same age as the modern state of Israel is today. There was a delicate power balance across the frontier of the Jordan Valley. All that was to change, though, when King Baldwin IV set in motion plans to build a new stronghold on his kingdom's frontier. A fortress that could drastically alter the strategic status quo. The castle of Vadim Jacob was the result. Archaeologist Tim Sutherland of England's University of York has studied many medieval sites, but so far none relating to the Crusades. The history is amazing enough, but the archaeology is opening up a complete new dimension about what we know about the Crusades. It's the first time Tim's been to Israel, walking in the footsteps of the European Crusaders who came here more than 800 years ago. First time I've been in Israel, it's, it's fantastic, I love it. It's a very interesting 
countryside, isn't it? I mean, it's very undulating. We're really high up here. I don't know how many thousand feet we are up above the, uh, the river valley we've just come up from, but it's, uh, it's a steep climb. So I'm looking forward to uh, having a walk around. Tim's heard about the amazing wealth of archeology span that Israel has to offer, dating from the earliest prehistory and biblical times through to almost the present day. Now he's here to see for himself. Israel's such a small country, really, but, but there is so much archaeology from so many different periods. We're talking about the Biblical period, Byzantine period, all the way through the Romans to the modern day. And there's traces of all those cultures in every bit of it. Nowhere is Israel's archaeology more apparent than in the golden city itself, Jerusalem. Yeah, Jerusalem has, has an attraction unlike anywhere else, so it's difficult to, to sum up how impressive it is, really. Also, spiritually, rather than just, you know, it's not just another tourist site. This is like one of the holiest places on earth to a lot of people. You know, there are churches, there are mosques, there are, there are sites that I've, I've only ever read about in books and seen pictures of. And so it's very humbling in some ways. You know, here I am, and, and it's, it's taken a long time to get here, but it's very impressive. What's brought Tim to Israel is the groundbreaking archaeology at the ruin of Vadim Yaakov, a hundred miles north of Jerusalem. On the way there, he wants to take a look at another Crusader castle in the same region. Joining him on the journey is medieval historian and author Dr. David Nicole. For somebody who has a passion for history, special, especially for Middle Eastern history, um, this part of the world just grabs you. For me, I fell in love with it. I, I love the local culture, I like the food, the, the climate is generally good in terms of allowing you to do stuff unless you go in the winter. Um, yeah, I fell in love with it. It's, um, it's that kind of passionate place. Like most castles here remaining from the period, this one too is now a ruin. But enough of it's left to give an impression of how a major stronghold on Jerusalem's frontier appeared during the late 12th century. In fact, this was the toughest and most impressive Crusader castle in all the Holy Land, the Fortress of Belvoir. There were many smaller castles and fortified manors scattered across the Crusader kingdom. Most were held in the name of the king by Crusader barons or knights. But Belvoir was different it had been built by one of the new crusader forces in the Holy Land, the Knights Hospitaller. The castle was built from black basalt and white marble and would have been visible for miles. Black castle, it, it, it's a bit somber, it's a bit grim, but my giddy art, it's effective. They are using some white, a small amount of white, but it's for decorative purposes, arches, things which uh, need to have attention drawn to them. And also, it's a hospital of castles. <laughs> they're, they're, black they're, and they're, white. They're black and white. Probably making a statement with the materials immediately at hand anyway. Over the years, many of the original Crusader knights had returned home, leaving the kingdom overstretched in defending pilgrim routes and cities. A new force had come into being to fill this vacuum. Religious orders of knights sworn to fight for the cross. Among the most notable were the Knights of St. John, the Hospitallers, and those who began as the Order of the Poor Knights of Christ and the Temple, the Knights Templar. The thing about the Templars, and to some extent the Hospitallers, they didn't do anything else really at this stage other than fight. They just dedicated themselves to holy war. And as such, they became very, very effective professionals. It was the Templars who urged the King of Jerusalem, Baldwin, to build a new castle on the frontier deliberately threatening Muslim control in the area. Vadim Yaakov was the result. It was to be a huge stronghold, perhaps the largest ever built in the Holy Land, larger even than the Knights Hospitaller's own great base at Belvoir. A powerful new castle built at the urging of the fanatical Templar order. The Muslim enemies of King Baldwin of Jerusalem could not let this stand. Vadim Jacob is a, a day and a half horse ride from Damascus. So anybody who has sat on horseback knows that a day and a half in the medieval period is not 
going to end you up with saddle sores even if you've never been on horseback. Things had changed across the eastern frontier too. A new star was on the rise in the Muslim world. His name was Saladin. Saladin, that is Salahuddin, rose to power dramatically and quickly, but it's not a case of coming from nowhere. He had a background, a launch pad, which he was able to use and fortunate in that the circumstances enabled him to establish a dynasty. He came to power at the right time for himself. Saladin's first move is perhaps surprising to us now, as we imagine the Crusades as a religious war of bitterly opposed ideologies. Saladin did try and solve the problem by using diplomacy. He came with a very, very generous offer to the king and said, I will buy the fortress from you. He doesn't throw a sum of money. He actually calculates how much it costs the Crusaders to build the fortress up until that minute. And when they decline the first offer, he comes with a bigger offer and he, he offers to buy it in order to solve the problem without sending the troops. Maybe the Crusaders knew Saladin was facing famine in his own land and could ill afford to go to war. The offer was refused. In spring 1179, Saladin launched an attack on Vadim Yakob, but it was badly handled and the Crusaders held out easily, so the Muslim force had to withdraw. Just weeks later, the curtain wall was completed, at least enough for the castle to be declared complete. The king's army returned to Jerusalem, leaving the rest of the construction under direct command of the Templars. Saladin licked his wounds, learned from his mistakes, and later that year, he struck again. It's important to remember that when Saladin attacks the fortress in August, it's the second time he's been there. But by August, when the shell of the fortress is already built, so many of the the army, actually, a lot of them already leave the site. So the majority of the people at the site are actually workers, builders, carpenters, and they're really caught with their pants down. They did not expect Saladin to return and try and take the fortress. Saladin knew he only had five days to take the unfinished castle. That's roughly how long it would take a relief force to arrive from the nearest crusader city, Tiberius. Everything had to happen like clockwork. I think he calculated every move. I, I don't think he left anything to chance. Um, I think he, he knew it would take Baldwin IV a long time to get his forces together. I also think he probably knew that they will be surprised that he's returning. So he had more advantages here than the Crusaders had it. Five days. All the Templars could do was keep building and hope to hold out. The stage was set. This time, Saladin intended to have his way. Vladimir Yakov would fall. People knew there was a castle at Vadim Jakob, but no one had ever investigated it. Ronnie Ellenbloom grew up fascinated by his country's richness in history and archaeology. I think the first time I became interested in the history of the Crusades was, uh, was when I was 14, hiking in the north of the country and visiting the castle of Montfort. Uh, the place was just beautiful. He was captivated and began to study Crusader castles. In the 1990s, Ronnie mounted the first expedition to Vadim Jakob. He quickly realized it was an ambitious undertaking, so he pulled together a team of people from all over Israel. Archaeologists, geologists, historians, many of whom had never worked on an excavation before, let alone at a Crusader castle. I remember hearing about Vadim Jakob the first time and thinking, what an amazing story. It's 
something that's almost too good to be true. I really couldn't wait to get on site and have a look at it all. It sounded fantastic. The excavations took place over several years. For all concerned, it was a labour of love, a fantastic opportunity. Like many of the archaeologists involved, Kate Raphael was just starting her career. It was one of those strange coincidences. I was staying on a kibbutz nearby the fortress. I was already studying archaeology and um, somebody on the kibbutz said, there's an excavation just below, go and see. And I hopped over uh, to have a look and they were in need of an archaeologist and I got the job uh, without an interview, without anything. They just needed somebody for the season. It was hard work, but the team was young and enthusiastic, especially to be working on such a once-in-a-lifetime site. I think the team was unique. There was a very strong buzz of this go, 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 go. Surviving Crusader castles were usually reused over the centuries, stripped clean of most of their medieval archaeology. But Vadim Jakob wasn't like this. Beneath a top layer of earth, Kate, Ronnie and the others found the ruins left by the 1179 siege. When the artefacts started surfacing and the story became more evident and we could match the historical sources with what we were finding, it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was very hard to stay calm and, and everybody was just... A, there was this ongoing excitement, which is very hard to maintain in sites. It was a compelling story, ready to be unlocked, and the tale of a bloody siege told. The builders of Vadim Jakob, carpenters, quarrymen, stonemasons, hundreds of them from all over the kingdom, knew their only chance was to try and get the fledgling fortress to a state where it could withstand assault. Saladin couldn't allow Vadim Yakov to be completed. His only chance was to eliminate it before it was finished. Finally, Tim arrives to see Vadim Yakov for himself. It's several years since the last archaeological work on the site. Well, it's more... There's more existing than I thought from the photographs I've seen. I was expecting it to be a lot sort of smaller and lesser in stature and stuff, but it's... Uh, it's it's quite tall, it's still a lot higher than I thought it'd be. Obviously a lot of it's still buried, which is amazing really. I mean, the earth is still pouring down off the, off the top, covering the majority of the walls. So it looks like most of it hasn't actually been excavated, which is surprising. I thought most of it had been excavated. There's obviously a lot of damage to the top. A lot of the facings come off the top, but the inner core's still there. And it's really impressive. And the, the Ashlar blocks are fantastic. They're really nicely formed and very closely uh, fitted together. Vadim Jakob is in a completely different kind of location, though, to Belvoir or other Crusader castles. It's a very odd place to have a castle because it, obviously it's overlooked on that side by the hill and it's overlooked on this side by the hill as well, which is bizarre because obviously usually you'd have a big promontory and you were on the high ground. This is finally it. I finally get to see it. You see photographs of these places and it never does them justice because obviously if you're not in the, in the country itself, you've not got the, the atmosphere around you. And suddenly here you are in the middle of a, a Crusader castle and you know exactly when it was built, defended, and within a very short time it was actually destroyed. And then everybody just moved on. It was never rebuilt, refortified, or even most of this rubble. There's no significant buildings all the way around here. So even the rubble, which was normally stolen and moved away to build houses and things, it was never really used. So it's, it's in remarkable condition. And the blocks here are just like almost the day that they were made. Much of the site is still buried. So it's not as easy to interpret as the more obvious ruins of Belvoir. But this gives it unique value for archeologists. The thing I found most, most important about this site is it's, it's a castle that's not been finished. There are gateways that are unfinished and there are buildings that are unfinished. It's one of the skills of an archeologist to try and work out how all these clues fit together. It is like a three-dimensional puzzle. 
And as soon as you get the first pieces, you start putting the puzzle together. And the more of the puzzle you put together, the more of this sort of bigger picture emerges. But you can't help but find other pieces and try to fit them in. And that's the complicated side of archaeology, because there are always more pieces to put into it. It's not just the remains of architecture. At Vadim Jakob, you're walking on artefacts all the time. It is amazing, but it brings its own problems for archaeologists. Everywhere you look on the ground here, there's pottery, and it's not just from one period. It seems to be pottery from a number of different periods. The problem is, where do you start? And you should start by cleaning the surface up and removing every single piece of pottery and then recording where you found it. But of course, when it's this abundant, it would drive you crazy. But you should do it that way. And then, of course, you can find out what's on the surface. And then as you dig down stratigraphically, as you go deeper and deeper, hopefully all those different periods of pottery changes as you go deeper. So you can then work it backwards. Who was there first? Who was second, third, fourth? Until eventually you get to today. But every time somebody digs a hole from the surface all the way down to the bottom and then backfill that hole, all that stratigraphy, all those bits of pottery get jumbled up. And the trouble with a castle like this is that everybody's digging holes everywhere. They come to the top of the hill, they think, this is a great place for a castle. And then they start digging holes and digging vaults underground and then building walls up and then filling the, you know, the rooms inside to so get a nice flat floor. So all that stuff just gets put back in and spread around nice and evenly. So of course everything is of all the different periods inside that floor level. Fortunately, the story of Vadim Jakob is very well documented in historical accounts. It's known that the site was abandoned immediately after the siege. So that gives a definable moment in time to work backwards from. We know that these people died on a certain date in history, almost within a few hours, and that's really crucial. It's almost like a shipwreck. Ships sailing along the, across the sea, suddenly something happens, catastrophic event, the ship goes down, and then if you come and discover that ship hundreds of years later, you can do the archaeology of the ship and you can find out exactly what was on that ship on that day when it sank. Saladin's first move was to encircle Vadim Jakob, sealing it off. His archers launched a relentless hailstorm of arrows at the defenders, harassing their every move. There was no time for siege engines to knock the walls down. So instead, he mined under them. For three or four days, both sides toiled hard. The Crusaders throwing up barricades and any kind of defense they could. The Muslim attackers scraping away at the foundations of the wall. Then there was a great roar, smoke and dust. The Muslims had broken in. Part of the North Wall collapsed in an avalanche of masonry and fire and a savage fight over the burning breach followed. At about the same time, they also attacked the South Gate. There is desperate fighting here. There is a break-in, but at the same time, there's a break-in at the other end. The castle falls from both sides, people making desperate stands, still perhaps hoping against hope that the king's army, the king of Jerusalem's army, is going to appear over that thar hill because he was only a day away. And we're talking about later perhaps in the day, he's only half a day away. So this isn't um, despair until, you can say, almost the last few minutes. They're not coming to rescue us. So they go down fighting and there is slaughter. Kate and the other archaeologists picked their way methodically through the remains of this epic battle. They returned year on year, gradually gaining an understanding of the complex site. It was painstaking work, usually in the hot Israeli summer. There are many, many, many days where you're just moving dust and stones from one part of the planet to another part of the planet, and you find absolutely nothing. Whether you're working with radars and the satellite photographs and the aerial photographs and still the bucket and the spade cannot be replaced. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's just, you have to have patience. And if there's one thing I really learned is go and get yourself more than a handful of patience because that's the only way to do it. And that patience paid off. No other site in Israel from the Crusader period 
in fact from almost any medieval castle anywhere, has yielded such evidence. At the Israeli antiquity storehouse in Bet Shemesh, Kate Raphael shows Tim and David just a small selection of the many hundreds of individual artifacts that were recovered. There's evidence of the furious work that went on to complete the fortress. Most of our metal artifacts belong, belong to the world of building, quarrying. We definitely seem to have a full range of not just building material, but quarrying material as well. If we've got the, if we've got the wedges that split the rock open. Our quarries are about five minutes walk from where the fortress is being built. So we have this wedge here, which is really still very heavy. Um, and several of them were actually found uh, in the quarry itself. And those are actually used to crack the, 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 the building stone open right. from the bedrock. So most of your um, of the masonry work is done in the quarry in order to reduce the um, the weight of the stone. So by the time they arrive on the site, you've got the stone almost ready to be fit in its place on the wall. There were all sorts of tools, echoes of artisans and labourers who found themselves caught up in a vicious battle for survival, and some would have been very familiar to the archaeologists who excavated them. So this is, as far as I'm concerned, a typical trowel that we would use today, except in terms of the scale. So the only person who would use that today would be a, a, a builder who would lay bricks. He'd need a big blade to put more mortar on top of the bricks. But in terms of the scale, it's exactly the same as the ones we use today. And that's fantastic in that they have obviously found it useful and this same implement is still useful today to do exactly the same job. But in terms of the context we're talking about here, this could also be used as a weapon. Yeah, it's definitely heavy enough and lethal enough. And if you were desperate enough. Tools which might have been used in bitter self-defence. But what about weapons? One of the enigmas we had is that we have 95% of our artefacts belong to the world of building and construction and we have very, very few weapons here. What we think happens is that a lot of the weapons are worth a lot of money. And after the battle is finished, the people who won comb the site of the fortress yeah. and they collect everything. And what doesn't fit them, they just take back to the market in Damascus and they sell it. So there's a lot of weapons that are gathered from, uh, from the battlefield um, and by the time we come, archaeologists arrive in the field, very little is left. One thing you have noticed is that you do have hundreds, if not thousands, of the, these arrowheads. Over several seasons, hundreds of arrowheads were eventually recovered. Most had been shot into the defences by Saladin's archers. Arrowheads, each one representing a shot in anger at a living opponent. Splinters that remain of the fury between mortal opponents. When we were excavating them, we were just like finding them all over the place. And uh, to, to an extent that one of the archaeologists uh, came to me uh, and it was quiet. Everybody had gone to breakfast and he had said, Kate, can you hear them? I said, oh no, he's got sunstroke. And, and but really, th there was just so many arrowheads that you could actually, if you did close your eyes and use your imagination, you could hear them whistling by you. Much of the work focused on the southeastern corner of the castle, a complex maze of foundations and unfinished structures, all subsequently razed or buried after the Muslim siege. Slowly, they made sense of the architecture. Along the eastern side of, of the fortress, there was a huge corridor that stretched to about 150 meters. Now this was divided into sections and the entire 150 meters had a, a vault on them. The huge vault or hall would have resembled the one inside Belvoir, only much larger. It would have been at the core of a giant castle. 
the castle is is impressive now but if it had been finished it would have been enormous and not only that it would have been dominating the whole landscape around it and in that respect it would have had a, it would have had an influence on the surrounding landscape and the surrounding region you can't underestimate how important that castle would have been in that location at that time it might have changed events completely if it had been finished but it never was instead the fledgling vault became a graveyard. What happened was that at the end of the battle, Saladin destroys the vault and all the stones fall on whoever was dead or dying beneath them. What he does, as far as an archaeologist is concerned, he freezes a period and nobody ever walks into that period until we arrive on the scene. There's even rare evidence all around this area of makeshift defences as the Crusaders prepared for the end. Here you can see the, I, I will call it barricade. You see that someone was trying in the last uh, hours uh, to, to defend himself, hoping that uh, he will see the, the help coming from I don't know where. Help definitely wasn't coming. The relief column never made it to Varnyakov. They were on their own. Late on the fifth day, they made their last stand. Some people get trapped in this corner and they, they go down fighting. I mean, what else can they do? Be beg for mercy at this stage of a siege, you don't get mercy. If they break in, you die. And if you're going to die, you try to take some of them with you. So you can imagine desperate close quarter fighting here with close quarter weapons, swords, sabers, axes, spears, maces, you know, whatever they've got. Trowels, spades, remembering that quite a lot of these people were just simple laborers, they got trapped here. So they're going to go down fighting, even if they know that any hope of rescue is gone. But this is where they're going to sell themselves dearly. We're archaeologists, we just pick through what's left, but for them it was real, and there was nowhere to run. What was left was a grim reminder of the reality of medieval conflict. And here you can see all the area we, we excavated, we excavated the, all the slaughterhouse, all the a common grave. After the battle, this corner of the site became a charnel house. The place was on fire. People were carrying uh, dead bodies and throwing them here. Across this area, tangled among the rubble of the collapsed walls of the unfinished vault, were more than a dozen skeletons. But to the archaeologists' surprise, they weren't just of humans, but of animals too. For the team at the Archaeozoological Faculty of Jerusalem's Hebrew University, this was the kind of opportunity they'd always dreamed of. Ronnie uh, called our lab, it was in Jerusalem, and uh, asked us uh, to, to come and see what he got in uh, Vadum Yakub. And then we came and we saw uh, a beautiful uh, excavation with a lot of uh, um, uh, equid bonds. Equid, horses, donkeys, mules, are the horse family among the most important animals of the medieval period. And here they could be tied to a solid date and context. That's extremely rare, perhaps one of the most groundbreaking aspects of all the work at Vadim Jakob. I think that the excavation of the horses and the, the, the humans, from my point of view, are the most important because there you can get most of the information or you can uh, have information that you can't get from the walls themselves. So after the excavation, you know, the first thing is just to sort out the bones and, and see what you have. We found uh, uh, at least 10 uh, equids and it was very difficult to say which one is a horse or a donkey or a mule. Hadas Motro worked out that there were two or three horses. It was difficult to be certain. The rest were mostly mules, the utilitarian beasts of burden on a medieval site. So if you look at the, the, the mules, probably the mules were used to carry the, the stones from the quarry into the uh, castle. And the horses were used for the battle. 
Horses from medieval battle sites are very rare. And here there was an opportunity to unlock one of the mysteries about Crusader, perhaps even Knight Templar horses. Once we identified the horses and separated them from the mules, there were two questions that we wanted to, to answer. First is which breed, whether it was a local breed like Arabian horses, or whether it was a European breed like a Shire or a big horse that we know the knights used to uh, ride on. Once we know the breed, we, we wanted to know whether they were born in Israel and uh, raised in Israel or whether they were brought from Europe over to, to Israel. Gila and Hadass tried extracting ancient DNA from the bones as part of a wider study on the origin of Crusader horses. It was only partially successful, maybe due to the burning of the bones during or after the battle. But when they combined what data they had with other techniques, they were more successful. We did some uh, isotope analysis, and with the isotope analysis, we could differentiate between some of the equid uh, remains in the site. We compared it to Icelandic horses that we knew that they are definitely from uh, Europe. Nobody really knew exactly how many horses or which horses did the Crusades bring to Israel and whether they were they came to Israel and then conquered or bought uh, some local horses and they rode local horses. We found that most of the horses that we found were actually Arabian or local horses and few were uh, uh, European uh, draft uh, horses. Pathology showed how the animals suffered, both in the battle and the aftermath. Some of the horses had a very bad death. They were you know, they weren't killed at the site. They were wounded, brought into the castle, and it took them a while until they died. You use animals for, for war. Today you have tanks or other uh, 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 machineries that uh, you use, but that was the time. As well as the animal bones, the collapsed vault also contained human skeletons. All of them were male, and all had been burned like the horses, meaning the profiling couldn't be conclusive. But they all shared characteristics present in European and Middle Eastern DNA. Crusader workmen, soldiers, or even knights. Maybe Templars, we'll never know. But the archeologists were amazed to find that one had a secret he kept concealed for more than eight centuries. One of them uh, had a stack of coins under his uh, armpit. And the coins uh, are actually dated to the exact date of the castle. So that helps also date the remains. Somehow Saladin's troops had missed out on a bonus. Maybe the crusader was already burning or covered with rubble. All the skeletons showed signs of violence. One in particular, had severe facial wounds. When you look at the skeleton, you could see a trauma. It was either uh, somebody used an ax or a, 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 a hammer or something to hit his head, and probably that what caused his uh, death. They were very young. Um, one of them, we think around the, the end of the 20s, you know, 27 maybe and they were healthy and young, and he was very tall, one of them, uh, really a um, um, warrior or something, I don't know. The battle that face to face, it's very brutal, and it's very hard to see. It's, it's not a... a a pleasant scene to see, you know, it's, you, you can feel the, the battle there. This corner of Vadim Yakob saved the last of its secrets until the very end of the excavation. There's something about archaeology. You can be there for days, weeks and months, but you know what's going to happen. According to Murphy's laws, the best finds come at the last moment 
at the last day of the excavation when you're already folding up all of the material and everybody is dying to get home. And um, we, ex we found a skeleton and we were slowly remo removing the, um, the dirt that was accumulated around uh, the skeleton. And when we got to the skull and the vertebra, so there were arrowheads stuck along the vertebra, he was cornered in, 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 in a place where he couldn't escape from, and he was shot at. The feeling was that he knew that it's very easy to kill him, you know, but I don't know why he just wanted to shoot again and again and again. So the picture that we saw, it was a person just lying, a, a, skeleton, a, a skeleton just lying like this in the corner, and then a lot of heroids. I remember thinking, wow, this is really great. And with all the adrenaline and the excitement. And then I remember this cold shiver running down my spine thinking, oh, wow, this guy was walking and he was breathing one. And yeah, uh, so it's that mix, mixture of, of feelings that goes through you. Um, and, and, and it was really like diving into the, the battlefield um, in the full sense of the meaning. Of those not killed in the fighting, the lucky ones faced enslavement, probably only the skilled laborers who would be of use to Saladin. For the rest, especially the Templars, there was no chance. In actual fact, this proved to be extremely bloody. When the, um, the castle fell, as far as we can tell, the people in it were wiped out. Certainly members of the elite, and especially the military orders, and in this case the Templars, they could expect no mercy um, because they had dedicated their lives to fighting against Islam. And as such, they, they, it'd be unrealistic to expect to be uh, accepted, even if they tried to surrender, which they very rarely did. Over around two decades, Ronnie Ellenbloom's extraordinary project has perhaps added more to the archaeological record of the Crusades in Israel than any other. Vadim Yaakov is an amazing site. It's changed the way we look at the Crusades, not just archaeologically, but on a human level. A medieval war is very, very uh, bloody and very full of... Uh, when you see it actually happens, I mean, you, you know, you know, and you think, but when you actually, you actually see what they did to each other, uh, it puts uh, modern uh, wars uh, also in different, uh, I mean, but it was one, one on one. It was not a kill, mass killing of millions, but I, I don't know. For me, all these types of violence are, <sighs> I don't like it, but uh, it's my my profession to investigate uh, to investigate uh, uh, ancient massacres, not uh, not modern ones. And that's it. The capture of Vadim Yakob was Saladin's first major victory. Within a few years, he defeated the Templars once and for all at the Battle of Hattin and recaptured Jerusalem for Islam. The Crusaders never again took the Holy City, and nobody ever again tried to build a castle at Vadim Yakov.